Okay, our next uh, observation is that cities, within cities, there are neighborhoods that really have distinct characters. Um, and these distinct characters are often, you know, rooted in history and many times kind of accidents of, of histories. Like for instance, like Venice in, um, in LA, it's like some developer wanted to remake Venice, Italy. And so we have these canals uh, in Venice. And obviously that is um, per, uh, persisted. You know, and so some neighborhoods really persist, you know, especially if you think about LA, like the topography of LA, LA has these like kind of like built in nice areas. People are going to want to live next to the beach. So that's like kind of a built in nice area. People are going to want to live on hills because of the view. And so you kind of have these built in nice areas that stay, stay rich. But at the same time, you do have neighborhoods changing. So you have this weird thing where you have a kind of neighborhood sometimes have persistent characteristics or persistent characters. But then also times you can have neighborhoods completely changing. Um, you know, when I was when I was an, uh, 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 an undergrad, uh, the the area in L.A., Palms, which is near Culver City, was like really rough. Like it was just a rough kind of, you know, a dangerous, not super dangerous, but, you know, not the nicest neighborhood. Now, Palms is it's very dense, but it in many ways is upscale, has like lots of you know, fancy restaurants, the rents are super expensive. When I was an undergrad, rents there were next to next to nothing. Now it's, it's much different. So neighborhoods can can also transition. And we'll be talking about this um, in the class. Why, why do some neighborhoods transition? What is that? What is that process? Okay, other weird thing about cities is that certain industries cluster in certain cities. So you will have, you know, say finance in Manhattan, you know, finance is clustered around Wall Street. In LA, of course, we have the film industry. We'll talk a lot about the origins of the film industry um, in LA and why all the film is, uh, 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 is here. Traditionally, at least in the mid 20th century, most of your auto manufacturing was in Detroit. Now that has changed a lot, but you know, traditionally is located there. Obviously we have tech, we have tech hubs in the Bay Area in Seattle and then traditionally meatpacking uh, in Chicago. And so we'll sort of talk about, you know, why, what is the benefit if you're a company to being near your competitors and why do certain areas have the industries um, that they have? And many of these are just quirks of, uh, of history. Okay, last observation, kind of a weird one, kind of a mathematical one, and that is Zip's law. This one's a little confusing, so you know, buckle up, stay with me. So if you take the log of the rank of the city, okay, in population. So in the US, number one is New York. New York has the biggest population. Number two is LA, I'm guessing. So number two is would be would be, you know, LA. Number three is Houston. I should know this. I'm an urban economist. Um, anyway, so if you take the so for New York, New York's rank one. So if we take the log of one, and plot that against the log of New York's population, then we go to LA, we take the log of two and plot that against the log of LA's population. So again, if you're like, like what is log? I can't, you know, you're maybe you, you know, forgotten, you haven't messed around with log that much. Just, you know, just look it up or put it in your calculator. You'll kind of see uh, the way uh, it works. And I'll also include a video kind of discussing the differences between using log on graphs and um, and just using uh, the number itself. But anyways, if you do this little simple mathematical transformation, taking the log of the rank, so you know, rank is one, two, three, four, et cetera, the log of the population, and then you graph them. So here's here, this would be New York. So we're taking the log of one, which is zero. So this is why it's here. The log of its population, which is, I guess, 16.5, 16.7, something like that. This would be LA. This would be the number three city, which again, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting what the three city is. I'm guessing it's Houston, um, which would be here. Um, and then, uh, you know, and so on. Okay. So if you plot up, this is the top 100 cities in LA or in, in the US. What's weird is they almost perfectly follow this line. So we get a little deviation here, but they very, very match uh, a line. And so you could also, you could think of why is this weird? Well, what it's showing is there's kind of a clear pattern between the cities. Like you could think of a world where cities kind of had generally the same population. In that case, what, you, what, we, what we would see is more of a straight line if they all have the same population. But cities seem to follow this weird pattern and nobody knows why it's like this. And we see this in all sorts of data. That if you take the log of the rank, and the log of the population, plot it, 
there is generally you can draw a straight line with a slope of negative one or slope close to negative one through the data points. No, again, nobody knows why. It's just a super weird fact about cities in a place. Um, and so if you go back in time, you see the same thing. Here it is in 1850. Again, similar pattern. All right, this would also be New York. But now you notice the populations are lower because we're in 1850. And this, per, this, just, this pattern persists. If we just do this each year in the US, you will kind of see the same um, dots, even though, of course, the cities are changing in population. And also, some cities are rising and some cities are falling in terms of their rank. So New York has you know, kind of maintained its rank as number one. Number two is LA. So here comes LA. You know, LA is like a LA in the 1800s is a total backwater. It's like one of the most violent cities. Um, it was not even a city. It's like an outpost back in the 1800s. It's like one of the most violent places um, in the US. And then boom, it shoots up to number two. Number Oh, so sorry. This is actual city proper, not the metropolitan area. So if you take the metropolitan area, uh, yeah, Houston would be higher. So this is just the city proper. Um, here's Chicago, number three, SF, number four, Philadelphia, um, and so on. Dallas. Yeah, yeah. But if you take the metropolitan area, trust me, Houston's higher. All right, I know what I'm talking about. Um, anyways, so the point being, though, even as we have this, like, you know, movement around of cities, cities rising, where's Detroit? Detroit would be the one that falls. Oh, here's Boston. Here's Boston that falls in its rank. Um, where is Detroit? Detroit was big in the mid 20th century. There, there it is. So you can see, you know, Detroit falling here. So you can see this just even as the cities are moving around, we still have this Zips law being apparent. So it's just, again, it's just a kind of a super weird, fun mathematical fact. And we see it all over the place. If you plot, um, if you plot um, kind of the rank of terms of most popular words and then how often they're used, they also follow Zips law. And you see it in other places. So even if you do it within California, you see a similar, uh, the top 25 cities in California here, top 100 in California, you see a similar pattern. You do it in Korea, similar pattern. You do it in China, similar pattern. Um, and so just to give you an example, let's say you have 100 cities. This is what it would look like, basically. If you just kind of randomly assigned uh, the populations. Not randomly signed. This is like kind of what it would look like if you had um, 100 cities. This is basically what Zips Law is representing is that you're going to have kind of two, one or two very big cities. Then you're going to have like three cities kind of with like half that population, then six cities with like half that population. So basically, what's, what's going on with Zips Law is you're doubling this number and having this number. So you're going to have like one mega city and then kind of two cities that are kind of uh, half that size and then four cities that are half that size and so on. That's kind of what it's representing. Okay. And so that just seems to be the natural form of urban areas within a place. And again, nobody knows why that happened. One theory is that it's called Gebrat's law. And that is if cities grow at random rates pulled from the same uh, distribution, you're basically going to get one city that has a bunch of lucky draws and that's going to be your big city. Some other cities that kind of get some lucky draws and so if you do that, this is a simulation, starting all cities at the same population. If you do that and just assign them random draws of in growth rates from the same uh, distribution, push, push play here, you know, you will eventually arrive at Zip's law. Okay. All right, but again, this is just a bit of a mystery. A um, bit of a mystery that nobody knows why I, it's like that. Okay, so in this class, what we're going to do, we're going to think about what is the advantage that the city offers? Okay, why is economic activity really concentrated? And what determines what type of activity? What determines what industries locate in which cities? Why do people and firms, so not only people, but firms have to pay a lot to rent space in cities. So why are they willing to pay that huge premium? Why do some cities decline? You know, Detroit is this, you know, one of the largest cities in the US and it has declined. Like I mentioned, LA went from nothing to the second largest city. So what is driving those patterns? Why are cities different in these other characteristics? Uh, density, segregation, uh, transportation networks, what's causing that? Why do neighborhoods transition? Why do neighborhoods go from being, say, a low-income neighborhood to a high-income neighborhood? Um, and what are the characteristics of those neighborhoods that really matter? And then finally, policies. What do policies have to do with all of these topics? Okay, that is 
where we're going in this very, very short, shortened version of urban economics.